Um, please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So as I mentioned to you guys on Sunday, I, I didn't get halfway through my notes and I thought I'd leave it for Thursday. So we're continuing what we, what we covered on Sunday. Uh, so 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We only got to verse 11 in that. Um, but the title of the message tonight is very similar. On Sunday it was the married and the unmarried. Today it's the bound and the free. The bound and the free. So 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And I, we got the reading from Numbers 30, just so we wouldn't read the same chapter again. But there will be some of the, some of the verses from number, 30 is, from number 30 I'll be covering later on in the sermon tonight. So please look at verse number 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 12. Paul write, writing says this, But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. The first thing I want you to notice, just that very first part of that verse there, Paul is saying, but to the rest speak I. He's saying, I'm the one speaking these things. This is my advice, my advice as a man. And it says, not the Lord, not the Lord. Because if you notice, if you go back at, to verse number, uh, let's have a look at, where was that? Um, verse number, where was it? Where it says about the, the Lord's command. All right, verse number 10, just a verse before that. And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. So we saw the commandments of the Lord before. Do you remember what the commandments were? Not for a wife not to depart her husband, and for the husband not to put away his wife. And if they were put away, if there was a divorce, for them to remain unmarried or to be reconciled as husband and wife. That, that was the commandment of the Lord. Clear commandments of the Lord. We could see that from the book of Matthew, that Jesus spoke these words and they were completely compatible with what Paul was teaching here, right? But now it says, now I speak, you know, not of the Lord. So some people have said, well, hold on, maybe the rest of this chapter then isn't really the commandments of, of the Lord. I don't need to pay attention to what is written here. Now, I don't know if that's what you guys think, because Paul's saying, hey, this is not from the Lord. This is, my, this is of me. This is my advice. Look at verse number 25. Look at verse number 25 in the same chapter. He says, Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment. So he's continuing saying, look, I'm, I'm continuing, continuing giving you my advice, giving you my judgment. And look at verse number 40. Verse number 40 says, But she is happier if she so abide, after my judgment. So he says, again, it's my judgment. It's my advice that I'm giving you. But look what he says at the end of verse 40. But I think also that I have the Spirit of God. So he says, look, this is my judgment. This is my advice. But I have the Spirit of God. <laughs> so who's actually speaking these things? It's God. It's the Holy Spirit through Paul. Paul is given his advice. Paul is given his best judgment. But he's a saved man. He has the Spirit of God. And God sees fit to have this advice from Paul canonized in the Scriptures. Because you guys know that this isn't the first letter to the Corinthian church. There was a previous letter. Yeah, that's not canonized. Maybe Paul gave a lot of his personal advice as well there, but it wasn't the words of the Lord. We see that the, the Lord... Who, who, moved, who moved Paul to have this written down? It was the Holy Ghost, was it not? It was the Holy Ghost that penned these things. So we can't completely detach these things from the Lord Jesus Christ, from, from, from God's commands, and say, well, it's just Paul, it's just Paul's advice. Because that's what a lot of people do in this day and age. They don't like a lot of the things that Paul was, had, has written, such as a woman not usurping authority of a man, such as a woman not being able to teach in a church, such as, as, as a woman not being permitted to be the pastor of a church. They say, well, that was just a Paul's opinion. And they throw it out. They say, well, that wasn't the Lord's commands. But everything we have in the Bible, if this is our final authority, we must stand true to the Word of God. Okay? And we can't just disregard what Paul is saying when we know he has the Spirit of God and God saw fit to canonize these very words that he wrote down. So, yes, Paul is saying it's here. Please don't disregard it. It's still the Word of the Lord. But he says this, If any brother hath a wife that believeth not... So if you're a saved man and you're married to someone that's unsaved... Now, there's two ways that can happen. Either you marry them, you were both unsaved when you marry them, and then you got saved, but your wife is still unsaved, or you were in disobedience and you married an unbeliever, when you know you should marry a fellow believer, a fellow Christian. Okay, so that's basically the two ways that can happen. He says, a brother, have a wife, believeth not, if she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. Because I'm assuming that the people in the Corinthian church were saying, hey, look, I'm married to an unbeliever, 
should I divorce her? Should I leave her and marry an unbeliever? That's probably the kind of questions that would come in Paul's way. And he says, look, if your wife is pleased to dwell with you, if you guys are happy, having a, a great marriage and she wants to stay with you, and even though she may be against your personal beliefs, even though she may not want to come to church and is not interested to hear the things of God, if she's happily married to you, then don't put her away. And I would say to you, even if she's not happily married to you, don't put her away. Okay, because you've made a vow to her. You've promised to, um, to have her for the rest of your life. And look at verse number 13. And the woman which have a husband that believeth not. So now the roles are reversed. Now if you're a woman, a wife that's married to a husband that's not a believer, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. Okay? So if you are, find yourself, for whatever reason, find yourself married to an unbeliever, you're required to stay with them. Okay? You're required to stay with them. Don't think in your head that God wants you to divorce them and put them away. Okay? That's not God's plan for you. Your plan is to stay in that marriage with that, one, that person, as long as they're happy to dwell with you as well. Okay? So if two, be two, unmarried, two be unbelievers marry, one of them gets saved, you know, obviously you're trying to get your spouse saved, but if they don't get saved, remain with them. Verse 14. For, it, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband, else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. So is this saying that if you're, 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 a, you're a believer, is this saying that the rest of your house is automatically saved? Of course not, right? Every person must personally believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, and resurrection, in order to be saved. But what it's saying here, if you're a believer and you're in a household of unbelievers, or even your children are unbelievers, you have the ability to have a major impact on that family. You're able to bring in the morals and, and the commands of God. You're able to sanctify that house. In, in that, what that means is to cleanse it, to set it apart, to make it not be like the world. You have influence as a husband and wife for this household not to be completely worldly, not to be completely without God. Okay? And then it talks about the children. The children benefit from having, obviously, a believing parent. Because how much, how much easier is it for a child to get saved than for an adult to be saved, right? Because all you need is the, is the faith of a child to place it upon Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. So it's talking about the benefits of you being a believer married in an unbelieving family. It's not an ideal situation, but you have the ability to make that family sanctified, to be able to cleanse it from the world with the Word of God, and ultimately, we'll see later on, hopefully get your husband or, and, or wife saved. Verse 15. But if the unbelieving depart, so if the unbelieving wife or husband doesn't want to be in this relationship anymore, wants to be divorced, leaves you, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in some cases, but God hath called us to peace. So obviously we must try to keep our marriage. God hates divorce. We know that. We know God hates putting away. Okay? But if your unbelieving wife or husband leaves you, you're not under bondage. You're not required to keep that marriage together. If they depart, God wants you to be at peace. Okay? Let them depart. That's their decision. You've tried. You've tried to keep that marriage together. But if they want to leave, just let them leave and you be in peace. You're not under that bondage. You're not required to do anything else if they leave in that marriage. Okay. Now, some people will take this verse in verse 15 and misapply it about divorce. Misapply it about divorce. Because look at verse 39. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 39. Look at this. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth, but if her husband be dead... She's at liberty to be married to whom she will only in the Lord. So it says here that the wife is bound to the husband by the law because they, they've exchanged that vow. It's been, you know, it's been hopefully registered, a, a, a properly registered marriage in the eyes of the government. And it says, as long, as long as your husband is alive, the wife is bound to that law. Okay? Now, what they'll say is this well, how, how then are you set free? How are you set at liberty from that law? They'll say, well, when the husband dies. But then they'll, they'll take this verse in verse 39 and look at verse 15 and try to put these two together. Because it says, if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath caught us to peace. So hold on. If we're bound to the law, we're bound to the law as husband and wife until one passes away, 
But if, the un if, if we're married to an unbeliever and they depart, it says we're not under bondage anymore. Does that mean our marriage is in no more effect? Do you see how people take verse 39 and say, well, if my unbelieving spouse departs, then I'm not under bondage anymore. I'm free to marry. And I, th I think, I don't want to uh, mis misapply this, but I think Kent Hovind took this passage, put these two passages together, say, well, my wife wants nothing to do with me. You know, she doesn't want to be with me, so I'm not under bondage. I'm free to marry. I think, I think that's where he's taking this, okay? But I want you to understand, and I know it's difficult for us as, as English speakers, because we often, when, it, when, when we're talking about being bound or being in bondage, those things are very similar, and yet they're actually not that similar. So I looked up, like on, on a dictionary definition, what's the difference between bondage and being bound? Okay, first of all, if you're in bondage, that's basically a term of a slave. Okay? You're a slave. You have no choice. You're under obligation to serve. It's a negative connotation. Okay? Being a slave is not a good thing. Right? It's against your will. You're, 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 you're under bondage by some master. Okay? Now, if you look up the word bondage throughout the Bible, I looked up all 37 verses, all of them are negative. All of them have a negative connotation. Okay? It's like when Israel was in bondage in Egypt, for example. Okay? Always negative. But being bound is the past tense of bind. You know, being tied together. That's why when we talk about marriage, people say, when are you going to tie the knot? Because you're binding one another. You, 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 it, it, you know, you're, you're being bound to one another. And that's a positive thing. That's not a negative thing. That's a positive term, right? It's not slavery. You are choosing to tie that knot together. You are choosing to be bound as husband and wife. So it's not a negative thing, it's, it's positive. You know, when, when uh, they twain shall be one flesh and the two become one, that's being bound together as husband and wife. So when it says that the, 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 uh, the, the believing spouse is not under bondage if the unbelieving departs, it means that they're not required or forced to perform marital duties to one another. Okay, you're not forced to still be a wife or still be a husband to that person should they depart. You're not, you're not in sin with the Lord. You, you, know, you're, you haven't done anything wrong in, in the eyes of the Lord. Okay? You're not under bondage. You're not, it's not a negative thing. You're not, you're not a slave to that person. Okay? If they depart, they depart. You can be in peace. Okay? But it's not saying that your marriage has, uh, is no longer um, lawful because that person is still alive. When we look at verse number 39, you're still bound to the law because your partner is still alive. Okay? And I know that's tricky, and unfortunately, in English, those words are very similar, and yet when I looked up the etymology of those two words, bondage and bound, they actually have different roots as well, okay? So in other languages, there's a, there's a, there's a clearer distinction, and even if you go back to the Greek, there's a clearer distinction as well, but in English, they sound very similar, so you can see why someone can take verse 39 and think, well, if an unbelieving spouse leaves, I'm free to marry, and I'm not committing adultery in that sense, Okay? Now let's look at verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 16. Verse 16. For what knoweth thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband, or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? So if you stay with your unmarried spouse, you don't know, you might very well save your married partner. And then it would be fantastic, because then you have two like-minded believers saved by the blood of the Lamb, and you have you know, God as your authority, and how much greater of an influence, how much greater would that family be sanctified and made holy should both husband and wife uh, be saved? And, I, and I, think of, I think of Rob and Christy, for example, you know, who were married and they were unsaved, then Christy gets saved, and then Rob gets saved, and you know, now they're faithful members of the church, you know, serving the Lord, trying to do the best they can uh, for the Lord, and that's a, that's a great example, verse 16 here, uh, you know, of, of a family that we have in the church. Now, verse 17, verse 17. But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called everyone, so let him walk, and so ordain I in all churches. So as previously mentioned, some men are given to be married, and others are not. You know, that they might make themselves eunuchs, and are not given into marriage. Paul is saying, look, God distributes this to every man. Some to this, to, to be married, some to be unmarried. Verse 18. Is any man called... Uh, is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. 
So it's something to the Jews here. If you're, you're a Jew and you've been circumcised, look, that's fine. You don't need to be uncircumcised. If any cord, um, if, is any cord in uncircumcision, let him not be circumcised. So if you're not circumcised, you're not a Jew, you don't need to try to be circumcised. These things go together. I'll show you shortly why. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keeping of the commandments of God. So what Paul is saying here in these verses 17, 18, 19 is that whatever state you're in, be content. Whatever state you're in, be content. If you're married, find contentment in your marriage. If you're unmarried, be content that you're single. Okay, because what we saw last time is you can serve the Lord in a greater capacity if you're single. If you're uncircumcised, be consent, content. If you're circumcised, be content. Don't try to be like someone else. You are how you are. You know, you, you were raised a Jew or you're a Gentile or you're married or you're unmarried. Be content in the Lord is what he's saying. What's important? Keep in the commandments of God, verse 19. That's what we ought to be doing. Don't matter what state you are, if you're rich, if you're poor, if you're healthy, if you're sick, do the commandments of the Lord in the ability that God has given you, no matter where you are. And I promise you this, if you stop worrying about, you know, oh man, I'm single, I need to be married, or if you're married, man, I, you know, I wish I was, I was wiser in my choice in marriage. If you just say to yourself, Lord, I'm going to be content in the situation I'm in. Please help me to find joy in my position. Help me to find joy in my family. Help me to keep your commandments. I'm telling you, your joy will, will abound. You'll be more content than you've ever been, but not because of the state you're in, but because you're following after the commandments of the Lord. You know, verse number 20. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Look at this. Art thou called being a servant? Maybe some people are servants, right? And in the Old Testament, sometimes you'd give your whole life to other people. You'd serve other people. You know, you wouldn't have necessarily your own possessions, but you'd be a, a worker. You'd serve other people. You'd serve people with, with uh, maybe land and, and many riches. You'd work for them, yet you'd be able to live on their land and things like that. If you're called to be a servant, you know, let every man abide in the same calling. You know, that's fine. If you're a servant, that's fine. Be a servant. Verse 21, art thou called being a servant? Care not for it. Don't worry about it. But if thou mayest be made free, Use it rather. So it's better to be free than being a servant. So if you can free yourself, try to free yourself. But if you can't free yourself and you're a servant, don't care for it. Don't worry about it. Care not for it. Why? For he that is called in the Lord being a servant is the Lord's free man. So if you're a servant to man, but you're saved, you're free in Christ. You're free in God. He's paid for you for your body. He's paid for your sins. He died on the cross for your sins. He's made you free. Yes, you're a servant in this life, but you have something great to look forward to when you get to heaven. Okay? But then it says here in verse 23, but if ye, ye are bought with a price, there, there it is, ye are bought with a price, be ye, not ye servants of men. And I think I missed something. I think I missed 22. Let's read verse 22. For he that is called in the Lord being a servant is the Lord's free man. Oh, I didn't read the second part. Likewise, also he that is called being free is Christ's servant. So maybe you're not a servant. Maybe you're a free man. And I would say, as an Australian, you're a free man. Everyone has their own possessions. But if you're free, you know, don't live for yourself. You're Christ's servant. <laughs> you're Christ's servant. So you can keep his commands, follow after the Lord, do the calling that the Lord has for you as found in the scriptures. So whether you're a servant in this life, don't worry. God's made you free. But if you're free in this life, hey, you're a servant. Make sure you work for the Lord. Take full advantage of the fact that you are free because there are other believers that are servants and are restricted from being able to serve the Lord. So you ought to do much more for the Lord than what other people can do. Reminds me of Luke 12, 48. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. Now, I would say as Australians, the Lord has given us much. That means of much, much is required. Okay, we need to keep the commandments of the Lord, do His work, win souls, and, and know our Bibles better, and teach people the Word of God. Verse 23, ye are bought with a price, ye, but uh, be not ye the servants of men. Ye are bought with a price. Okay, so your body belongs to the Lord. So even if you are a servant of man, you're not really a servant of man. You're a servant of Christ. 
Okay, and if you are a servant and that's all you can do in your life, you can't really serve the Lord in your full capacity, hey, you can serve the Lord in the work that the Lord has given you to do. Okay, even if, if, if you're always going to be an employee, you know, just, just working hard, work, working in and out, you know, you, you're not, you don't have the luxuries that other employees have, you know, hey, don't worry, you know, serve the Lord in your workplace. Okay. Serve him. The Lord has purchased you with a price. That price was the blood of Jesus Christ. How valuable is that? Verse 24. Brethren, let every man wherein he is called therein abide with God. So whatever state you're in, be content. You belong to God and you should serve God. Now look, let's look at verse 25. We're now getting back to the singles. Encouraging the singles. Again, there's a lot of pressure on singles, a lot of pressure on Christian singles. When are you going to get married? Why are you taking so long? Things like that. No. You know, if, if that's what God has called you to be, be content in that as well. But look at verse 25. Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment as one that have obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. So he's saying, look, my judgment as someone that has been obtained the mercy of the Lord to be faithful. I'm someone that's single and I've been faithful to that. I'm not someone that commits fornication. I'm not someone that's in, you know, in any, any, any sexual sins. You know, I'm able to abide as a single man. So concerning virgins, concerning those that are single, he says in verse 26, I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. I say that it is, a good, it is good for a man so to be. So reaffirming what we read in verse number one, that it is a good thing to be single. It is good for a man not to touch a woman, if you remember that in verse number one. It's a good thing to remain single. How much works did Paul do for the cause of Christ? How much work did he do for the kingdom of God? How many books in the New Testament was Paul able to pen and, and, and do? Okay, how much rewards is he going to have in heaven for all eternity? And he was a single man. A single man. You know, look, if you're a single man, look to Paul and be a hard worker for the things of God. It's a good thing to be single. Verse 27. Art thou bound unto a wife? So see, there's that, there's that bound. It's not bondage. Art thou bound, being tied together unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. Again, be content where you are. If you're bound to a wife, don't, want to get, don't try to get divorced. Don't desire a single life. You know, spend time with your wife. Work on that marriage. Raise the children together. But if thou art loose from a wife, if you're single, seek not a wife. Don't put this unnecessary pressure upon yourself that thinking, you, I, I must get married before I'm this age or that age. Hey, be content in the, in, in, in the position that you're in. Verse 28. But if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. So Paul is just reaffirming, hey, yes, it's great to be single, but if you, if you get married, it's not a sin. Okay, remember, it, it's permissible, it's fine. The Lord wants people to get married so we can raise a godly seed, so we can raise a godly generation. Verse 28, but if, uh, And if a virgin marry, she have not sinned. Nevertheless, such, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. <laughs> so what he's saying is, look, it's fine, it's not a sin to marry, man or woman, but those that marry have trouble in the flesh. You know what? Marriage is not perfect. You're, you're going to have marital conflict. There's going to be troubles in the flesh between husband and wife. That's normal, okay? If you're married and you're having arguments and fights, don't panic. Don't think, man, my, my, my marriage is over. We're fighting because when I look at, you know, when, when, I, when I look at other people around me, they don't seem to be fighting. No, look, everyone that's married has problems. Everyone that's married are going to have conflicts. Why? Because we have the flesh. We have the flesh. And he goes, but I spare you. Saying to the singles, look, I want to spare you from all that trouble. I want to spare you from all that heartache. And then he says, um, verse 29, he kind of explains this. It, it's, it's, it's a little bit hard for me to wrap my head around it, but I think I understand it a bit. Here, verse 29 to verse 31. But this I say, brethren, the time is short, it remaineth, that both they that have wives be as though they had none. And they that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they possess not, and they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passeth away. So what I think he's saying here, if I, if I understand this sort of riddle, this, this proverb, if, if you will, is that marriage takes time and is a distraction to the married couple. 
It takes time and it's a distraction. It's not sinful, but it takes time. It takes work. It takes effort. It's going to consume a lot of your life if you're married. There's weeping in marriage, but that weeping will come to an end. There's rejoicing in marriage, but that rejoicing will come to an end. The things you buy in marriage, those things at some point will fall apart. They'll, they'll fade away as though you've never possessed it, as though you've never purchased it. Especially when you have kids. You know, you try to buy nice new things, you know, forget it. You never... You might as well just get second-hand things when you've got a lot of kids because it's not going to last, okay? You use this world. And by the way, it's saying here, they that use the world not, and not abusing it. So, you know, again, this world in of itself is not sinful. It's not wicked. We can, we can, um, we can you know, we can benefit from things in this world as long as those things in of themselves are not sinful. It's fine. Don't abuse the world, but the fashion of this world passeth away. And one good example is I've put my kids into soccer. They had soccer practice this Thursday. You know, it's good for their exercise, it's good for their character and all that kind of stuff, but all that stuff's going to pass away. There's no real value in all of that at the end of the day. When they get to heaven, God's not going to, to turn around and say, well done, my faithful servant, for being in that soccer club and doing training every week. You know, it passes away, you know. But anyway, so this cycle that he's talking about is this distraction, this marriage distraction, not sinful, but requires a lot of work. And sometimes, it, you know, you do a lot of work, but then it comes undone, so forth and so forth. So, why is it good to remain unmarried? Verse 32, why is it good to remain unmarried? But I would have you without carefulness. So without, careful, without, you having, be, without being full of care, without being full of worry. If you're single, you don't have to worry as much, right? You don't have to maintain a family. You don't have to worry about raising the kids. You're without care. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. And let me just say, if you're unmarried, I'm talking about the kids here, Pay attention, kids. If you're unmarried, if you're single, you ought to pay attention to what Paul is saying here. He's saying you ought to care about the things that belong to the Lord. You need to care about the things of God. Are you reading your Bible? Are you trying to learn what what it is to be a believer, to be a Christian? Are you trying to find out what I need to do to be able to preach the gospel? Or are you spending your time on video games? Are you spending your time with toys? Are you spending your time on unnecessary, you know, uh, wasting your time? Things, or are you spending your time serving the Lord? Think about it. I'm talking about you kids. You're the unmarried. This is the person you're, that Paul is writing to. You ought to be spending your time. Hey, I'm not married right now. I can read my Bible from cover to cover. I can memorize verses. I have so much freedom to serve the Lord and prepare myself to, when I get older, to be able to preach the gospel and see many people saved. Verse 33, but he that is married, so guys, you and me, (laughs) he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. (laughs) So hey, you ought to be thinking how you can please your wife, honestly. That's what we should be doing, right? Because if you don't ever think about that, how can I please my wife, then you're not right with, with your wife and you're not ultimately right with the Lord. And you might be thinking, man, my wife has high demands and has a lot of things. Yeah, but, you know, sometimes just go out of your way and do something nice for your wife, right? Take her out. Take her out on a, on a date. Buy her a little gift. You know, I've started to buy my wife flowers every now and again. I've never did that before. I feel really, really bad doing that. But, you know, every now and again, I just, just randomly just buy her flowers or something, right? Just to please her. Just something, what, 10 bucks, $15 from Woolworths. That's where you get the cheap ones, right? You don't need to get the cheap ones. doesn't matter. She loves it. You know, do the little things for your wife that she would be pleased uh, verse 34, there is a difference between the wife and a virgin. So there's a difference between a married woman and an unmarried woman. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord. Just reiterating the same thing, that a ma- an unmarried man ought to care about the things of the Lord. So girls, un- un- unmarried girls, single girls, you ought to be thinking about caring for the things of the Lord. Okay, Using your time wisely, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married care for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. So, you know, probably the wives were happy for me to say, yeah, men, you know, you ought to please your wife, but women, you know, well, they're not here, they're looking after the sick kids or whatever, but, you know, you ought to be looking also for the, how to please your husband. You ought to be thinking, hey, how can I please my husband? And that is right in the Lord. Yes, you're caring for the things of the world. We're not talking about the sinful world. We're just talking about the marriage that is in the world. If you please your husband, you are pleasing the Lord. And if husbands, if you're pleasing your wife, you are pleasing the Lord. These are the commands of the Lord. These aren't, this isn't just the, the advice of Paul. Remember, it's the commandments of the Lord. Verse 35, 
and this I speak for your own profit. Not that I might cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely, that ye may attend upon the Lord without distraction. Again, I'm telling you these things, single man, so you can be without, distra without distractions, without the distra distractions of a, of, a, of a husband and wife relationship and children, so you can just continue to serve the Lord. Do more soul winning. Do more Bible reading. Do more praying. If you're single, think, hey, how can I help the church? You know, can I come and, and, and help set up the ch chairs? What can I do to help, you know, set up the church? Because I'm single, I'm free. I don't have the responsibility of looking after children. Uh, verse 36. Now, I wasn't going to cover these verses, but um, Jason asked me about this on Sunday. I, I was just going to cover them very briefly because I had so much stuff to go through. But I did look into it a little bit further. So let's read this. Verse 36. But if any man think that he behaveth himself uncomely toward his virgin, if she pass the flower of her age and need so require, let him do what he will. He sinneth not, let them marry. Let them marry. So it's talking about two... I think where it says here, um, it's an unmarried man, a single man and a single woman. Okay? They're, they're young, they love each other, they want to get married. Is it a sin for them to get married? No. Can they do much more for the Lord if they remain unmarried? Yes. Okay? They can. But if they want to get married, they, si they don't sin, let them marry. Again, uh, this just reinforces what I said to you on Sunday. Hey, you know, don't, don't um, cause people to de delay their marriage. Don't tell them, hey, just wait, you know, you know because then they're going to fall into fornication. They're going to do stupid things that they're going to regret for the rest of their life. Let them marry young if they can. Now, it says there, the flower of her age. Now, this is a bit controversial, but the flower of her age basically is when she, when, when, when your daughter, you know, goes through puberty. Okay, well, I won't, I won't, I'll leave it at that. So, I mean, usually a girl is around 12 years old or something like that. Is this saying that at 12 years old, she's fine to get married? Well, I mean, that, that's where the controversy is, right? But what it's saying here, if we, un we understand something, is obviously a girl that age, prior to that, should not get married, first of all, okay? So someone that's younger than that should not get married. And I think about that pedophile, um, Muhammad, of, of the Islamic. He married a girl that was nine years old. You know, Islam. The founder of Islam was this major pedophile that took a girl before the flower of her age and married her. I think she was nine. Obviously, that's wrong. That's a sin. Okay? But let's read on, and I'll just cover a few other things here. Um, I'm not going to leave that alone, but I will cover a few more things. Verse 37, Nevertheless, he that standeth steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but have power over his own will, and have so decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin, doeth well. So I had a, I had a thought about this. I had a different thought about this on Sunday, but I believe what this is talking about is the father of the virgin, the father of the daughter, okay? The he, I believe, is the father. And let's look at verse 38 so you can understand why I'm saying that. So then he that giveth her in marriage doeth well. So who gives their daughter to marry? It's the father, right? He doeth well, but he that giveth her not in marriage doeth better. Why is it better? Because being single, you can do more for the Lord, okay? The encouragement that exists there for the single person. So, what this is saying here is that it is the Father's responsibility and it is by the Father's authority, and I know this is old-fashioned, but the Father must allow his daughter to get married. If the daughter wants to marry a man, but they don't say anything to the Father and they just try to do their own thing, that is unbiblical and that is ungodly. That is wrong. That's why... In our, in our, even in our society, even in Australia, the culture still exists where um, the man goes to, the, to his you know, um, you know, future spouse's father, goes to his father-in-law, future father-in-law, and asks for the hand in marriage. Okay, I did that. You know, I, I proposed to Christina. You know, she said yes, thankfully. And then I can't remember how much soon afterwards, maybe a week after, I approached her father and said, I'd like to marry your daughter. And his response was, good luck. So <laughs> that, that, was, that was good. That was enough affirmation for me to say, yes, all right, I've got the authority of the Father. So just going back to verse 36. So 
a, a girl that, that is to be married obviously must first have gone through puberty, okay? But does that mean she's fine to get married now? No, because you still need the father's permission for that girl to get married, okay? You need the father's permission. Turn to Numbers chapter 30. Numbers chapter 30, we read, about, we read Numbers 30. Keep a finger in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I want to tie this together with what we read in Numbers chapter 30, okay? Because here's the thing. Like, Isabel's 12. Do you think I'm going to give her away in marriage at this age? No way. <laughs> no way, all right? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm waiting for my daughter to be old enough, to be mature enough, you know, physically, spiritually, mentally, and I want to make sure that the man she marries is at least a believer, at least is trying to walk in the commandments of the Lord, and then I'll approve of that, okay? So it's not just the flower of your age, now you're, now you're fine to get married. No, Dad, if you love your daughter and you're a godly man, you're going to wait when the time is right, okay? And the laws in Australia, I believe, you know, the laws in Australia, you need to be 18 years old to get married. But if one of the partner is 18 and they want to marry someone that's 16, they still can, but they must get um, permission uh, by, I don't know, permission by someone in the law. I don't know, I don't know the, full, the full thing of it. But even, even the law in Australia says, hey, 12 years old is too young. And I agree with that. <laughs> I agree with that. Okay, so, you know, obviously, I do believe that when you get married, it ought to be a legal uh, exchange as well, not just something done spiritually in the house of God, but some sort of legal transaction that takes place. Because then how do you give someone a bill of divorcement? You know, that, 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 that's a legal thing as well, okay? So we need to take into consideration the laws of, of, of man, though they do not usurp the laws of God, don't get me wrong, but also we must also take into account, as a father, are you willing to give your daughter over to marriage? And I, I believe, as most men, as 12 years old, will say, no way, you know, that's still too young. I think a wise man would say that. But Numbers chapter 30, verse 2, Numbers chapter 30, verse 2, it's talking about the importance of a vow, and obviously, if someone proposes and they, you know, will you marry me? And she says, yes, that's a vow. They've committed themselves for the future, in the future that they would get married. And of course, when they get married, they exchange vows once again between husband and wife. But verse number two, if a man vow a vow unto the Lord or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. So if you make a vow, you make a promise... Does God expect you to keep it? Absolutely. And so when you got married, you exchanged vows. Does God expect you to keep it? Absolutely. Does he expect you to have a divorce? No way. Okay? You, you, you make a vow, you keep it. Verse number three. If a woman also vow a vow unto the Lord. There's a bit of a difference here with women compared to men. You'll see it here. If a woman also vow a vow unto the Lord and bind herself by a bond, being in her father's house in her youth, so she's single, she's in her youth, she's in her father's house. It means the authority of that daughter is her father. Okay? Now, if she makes a vow, she promises to marry someone. Look at this, verse 4. And her father hear her vow, and her bond wherewith she hath bound her soul, and her father shall hold his peace at her, then all her vows shall stand. And every bond wherewith she hath bound her soul shall stand. So if my daughter, if someone proposes to my daughter and she says yes, when I hear about it, and if I just hold my peace, I just say, yep, okay, that's fine, you can do that, then she's bound to that vow, okay? She's bound to that vow. But look at verse number uh, five. Uh, but if her father disallow her in the day that he heareth, not any of her vows or of her bonds wherewith she have bound her soul shall stand. And the Lord shall forgive her because her father disallowed her. So if your daughter says, yes, I want to marry you, and let's say you find out a month later, they kept it a secret because they know you want to prove. They keep it a secret for a whole month. And then on, in the day you hear about it, you can say, no, you can't marry that man. And if you say that on that day, those vows are disallowed. You know, God's going to forgive her. He's, she's not required to keep those vows because the father said no. Do you see that? So even in the Old Testament, the father is the one that decides whether or not his daughter will make a vow. And of course, promising to get married and get married are vows. Okay? 
But again, if you hear about it, if you hear your daughter wanting to get married, and you say, hmm, let me think about it, give me a week. Nah, it's on the day. <laughs> the Bible says on that day. You better decide straight away whether you want your daughter to keep that vow or not keep that vow. And just one more thing that I'm not really going to cover in any detail. So yes, she needs to be past puberty. Yes, you know, a wise father will decide when she's old enough to allow her to get married and also has the ability to disallow her from getting married if, that, if she, he hears that vow and decides for that not to go ahead. But obviously, you want your daughter to want to marry that man. So it's wrong for a father to arrange a marriage and if that, that, you know, that your daughter does not want to go ahead with that marriage, it's wrong for you to force her to be in that marriage as well. So she needs to also consent and say, yes, I'm happy to marry a man because she's the one that makes that vow, not you. You can disallow it. You can break that vow on the day you hear it, but it's her that makes that vow. It's her decision. And I think of that story of Isaac when, um, when they found Rebecca. If you know, you know the story where they sent a servant and, and he's looking for a, a wife for, for his master and then um, it's Rebecca, right? Not right, yeah, Rebecca. And, um, and then her family asked Rebecca, hey, are you willing to go with this man? You know, they asked her, is this something you want to do? Do you want to get married to Isaac? And she said, yeah, I'm happy to go. Okay, so we see that, even, we see that practice even in the Bible, that it's important for the, for the, for the, for the um, unmarried girl to also desire that marriage, and it's wrong for a father to force them into marriage. All right. Let's um, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We're almost done. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39 and 40. The wife... There's not, not much more I've got to say here. I'll just finish it up. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. So, hey, if you get married, it's death... You know, it's till death do you part. Okay? It's till death do you part. How important is it, young guys, young children, for you to make sure that you marry the right person? It's for the rest of your life. Okay, and if you break that vow, you get divorced, you've done wrong, you've sinned against the Lord and against your spouse. Okay? Um, but if her husband is dead, she's at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. What does that mean? You marry someone that's a believer. You marry someone that's saved. Okay? Make sure. Because I'm telling you, the devil's going to send... Boys, the devil's going to send girls your way that are unsaved that are going to try to draw your heart away from the Lord. Okay? And you need to make a decision today, even as young boys, that I'm going to marry a believer. I'm going to marry a Christian girl. That's what you ought to set in your heart today so that when you get older and the devil sends someone your way, you, you know what, I've, what I've, you've committed to the Lord, that you must marry someone that is in the Lord, someone that's a fellow believer. Verse number 40. But she is happier if she so abide after my judgment, and I think also that I have the Spirit of God. So again, it's saying if she, she's happier if she, if she so abide, if she doesn't get remarried. Again, why? Because when you're single, you're not caring for the things of the Lord, to, for the world, you can care for the things of the Lord. So let me just finish off by saying, you know, if you're single and, you know, you feel pressure to get married, no, this chapter's for you. This chapter is to encourage you. Hey, you know, marriage, yes, it's, it's wonderful, but it has its problems. Marriage is great, but it's going to take you, you know, focusing on your wife and your children, which is fine, but you're not going to have the time to be able to serve the Lord in your full capacity. Hey, you can be a Paul in your life if you remain single. You can do great things for the Lord. So please be encouraged if you're single. But also, hey, when you get married, you make sure you keep the commandments of the Lord. You keep that marriage... For your whole life and not get divorced. Let's pray.